12, verse 28, he says, apostles first, then prophets, then teachers. Uh, but in Ephesians chapter 4, he says, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastor. Pastor is the fourth, the second to the last. Uh, why do we put so much emphasis on the gift that the, or the office that's second to the last in the order? On his ring of commitment, on his right hand of authority. We decree God now that this chief apostle will protect this office with his life. What if I could prove to you that he was not only the God of Ishmael, but that God picked Hagar to have Ishmael? Just saying, just saying. Just saying. A woman always knows. Uh, uh, how, how many of you know when Hannah went into uh, the temple to give Samuel uh, the script? When Samuel was born and she took Samuel to the temple, the scripture says that she lent Samuel to God. She didn't give him to God. She, why? Because there's an Old Testament law that says the borrower, which would have been God, was made subject to the lender, which would have been Hannah. And Hannah, Hannah said, you might get Samuel, but this ain't the last time you're moving in my life. So, and, and Samuel, how many of you know Hannah dictated, even though she gives Samuel to God, she dictated his growth because she made a coat for him every year. Every year she went to the temple and made a coat and prophesied how big he was going to grow every year. You might get that next year. So don't ever think for a minute Hannah wasn't in control. Don't ever think Hannah didn't know what she was doing. Amen. Sometimes that sometimes a woman knows. Sometimes a woman knows. Amen. Genesis chapter 14. I'm going to prophesy to you tonight and tell you we're coming to a new day, a new hour. Come into a new place. It'll be new to most of us. It ain't, it ain't new to God. But it's going to be new to a lot of us. And it's going to even be new to a lot of us that have been around for 30 years or however long. Because we're coming back around full cycle. And we're about to pioneer what we have learned ourselves. Because God spoke to me and said, All of my years in ministry have been but school. That that was not my day. That I'm just about to enter into my day. That everything that I have had up until now hurt my feelings. Does it hurt yours? It hurts mine. It hurt yours. Everything that I have been through has been for the process of my schooling. And all the people that have been with me in ministry for years and years and years that I know in ministry, Bishop Jordan, Apostle Lucas, and all that, we have been through a 30-year season of schooling in order to pioneer what we've learned through this schooling. So I'm going to prophesy to you tonight and tell you what's about to happen in the body of Christ. Genesis chapter 14. Verse 18. Is that Pastor Brunsfield back there? Love you, my friend. I love that man. Uh, Genesis 14 and 18. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Are you there? He was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God, most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God, most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hands. And he gave him a tithe of all. Now the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons, and you take the good. But Abram said to the king, I have raised my hand to the Lord God, most high, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take anything from a thread to a sandal strap. And that I will not take anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. Can I prophesy to you and tell you that Abraham 
is about to meet Melchizedek again. And that Melchizedek is a priesthood that's going to minister from a power and a source of endless life that creation has never experienced before. That Melchizedek, the scripture says when Melchizedek brought forth the bread and wine, it's the same word that was used when the Virgin Mary brought forth the Christ. So what Melchizedek is doing is bringing something out of himself to give communion with. So all these 30 years while God has, uh, has been doing with you everything that he's been doing, he's been putting communion in you. He's been putting a deposit on the inside of you. And that deposit is for Abraham and his seed. Can I prophetically tell you that the priesthood that is coming forth right now is going to minister after the power and the source of an endless life, going to minister in a realm we have not seen before, going to uh, minister in a place where the dead get up on a regular basis, where the shadows here, going to minister in a place of life that we have never experienced before. But because it's the season for Abraham and his seed to meet Melchizedek. <clears throat> Now, up until now, we've had a, a good priesthood. We've had a good time. And church has been great. But God has not brought us through the fire to preach just another good sermon. See, I, I, I acknowledge that you know what to do when you come out of the fire. But do you know what to do when your shadow heals? I acknowledge that you may be uh, in a tight place and, and you've rebuked the devil and prayed and all that. But what are you going to do when you get caught up to the third heaven? What are you going to do? I, I know that there's been attacks of the enemy and, and we've been in school. And, but what are you, are you prepared for your nets to break because of the overflow? Now, I see things a little different than other people see them. But I see what we have been through not so much as a testing as a preparation. And I have people call and say, Dr. Connie, what am I doing wrong? What am I, what am I doing wrong? Go to uh, Matthew. I must be doing something wrong. Excuse me, did I say Matthew? I was just kidding. John 15. <clears throat> we're going to look at some stuff in a different way tonight. Does the scripture say that he'll not put more on you than you can bear? Amen. But let's look at the scripture in a different way. I like to look at everything positive. And let's say that he's not going to put more on you than you can bear trial-wise. But he's also not going to put more on you than you can bear anointing-wise. Because when your shadow heals, you're out to want to make some Kool-Aid. When you go through the hospital, somebody gets up because you walk through, you're, you're saying, I'm going to start my own church. So, so I know we've been through the negative stuff, and I know we've been through the rough stuff, but can I prophetically tell you, there are only two tests in life, the test of success and the test of failure. And everybody passes the test of failure. Because when you're failing or you think you are, you'll hold on to God like you ain't never hold on to nothing. But when you get su uh, successful, you may want to go to the casino instead of come to church. You've been in church your whole life. Maybe I'm going to go to the movies instead of going to church. Or I'm going to take my tithe and do something with it. Besides, the church don't need it. Can I prophetically tell you... You have been through a season where you have had to stretch every dime, every nickel, every dollar, every, everything. For, can I prophetically tell you, you are about to be tested with overflow. Write it down. Write it down. And most people that pass the test of failure do not pass the test of overflow. 
We know how to get by. We know how to survive. We know how to pay half the bill this month and the other half that month. Then we're going to call them and predate a check and do it. Uh, But what are you going to do when there's overflow in your life? What do you... Uh, I love the parable when Jesus fed the, the 5,000 with fishes and loaves. And we're always hung up on that little boy that had the few fishes and the loaves. But the scripture says that he took up 12 baskets of scraps. Uh, see, I, I, I love that little boy, and I'm sure he was real sweet, and his mama put them fishes and loaves. But somebody that was following Jesus around had enough sense to bring some baskets. Twelve of them. So I appreciate the fishes and the loaves, but somebody got 12 baskets of leftovers because they knew that God was a God of overflow. So I know that we've been through some tight places. But what I'm saying now is as things lift, loosen up, what are we going to do now? We're going to remain faithful. We're going to get stupid. Because my cousin Fat Bear, y'all know him. He, sa he says there is no cure for stupid. <laughs> God rest his soul. He passed last year. But there is a... What, do you, what are you going to do with overflow? John chapter 15. I'm the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. I'm just going to suggest some things to you here. And you don't have to agree with me or anything like that. You can just kind of listen and humor me and, and uh, consider th this. Every branch, verse 2, in me, that does not bear fruit, he takes away in every branch that bears fruit. He purges that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I spoke to you. So who is Jesus talking to? He's talking to a group that's already clean. Talking to a group that's already for him, with him. You're already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. So he's talking to a people that already know what's going on. He said, I'm, uh, my father's the vine dresser. I'm the vine. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges it. Can I prophetically tell you, you have been through what you've been through, not because you've done something wrong, but because you've done something right. Can I prophetically tell you what we have been through has not been the attack of the enemy, although I know he's still out there doing whatever it is he does. I've learned during this season just how tiny he is. Would you consider that you've not been under attack as much as you have been being purged by God to handle your next day. What did I do wrong? What do I do wrong? Have you considered you might not have done nothing wrong? Well, I'll do stupid stuff and make mistakes. No. But have you considered that God already saw some fruit in your account? And when he saw that fruit in the account, in your account, he said, ah, let me cut away some stuff and see if I can't make that branch more fruitful. Now, it probably felt like tribulation. It probably felt like the devil. probably felt like hell. probably felt like that. But see, if you're sitting here tonight on a night when you should be at home or could be at home watching TV or something. If you're sitting in church tonight on an unscheduled night, if you're sitting in church, you've got God on your heart to a degree that you're hungry for Him or you would be at home watching Duck Dynasty. Them, them boys is my cousins. So if you're, let me sub submit to you, we know about the devil, we know everything that goes on, but let me submit to you that God himself, 
in this world you have tribulation and you ain't in the world regular people tribulate I always say uh, post trip mid trip pre trip you trip I trip we all gonna trip in the world you have could it be that something deeper is going on with you could it be that it wasn't all that could it be that there was a plan and a purpose even though it looked like hell could it be that there was a plan and a purpose for everything you went through to cause you to be in your right mind for what God is about to do with you. Now, I'll tell you the reason why. Melchizedek is the priesthood that's coming for this season. I believe we've seen glimpses of him. I believe uh, Enoch touched the Melchizedek realm when he was not. It doesn't say he went anywhere. It said he just ceased to be known as Enoch. Uh, uh, I believe Moses touched that realm of Melchizedek when he told Pharaoh, let the, my people go. And Pharaoh said, who says so? And Moses got so connected with God. He said, I am says so. Pharaoh said, who's that? He said, I am that I am. I believe from Genesis to Revelation, there's the types and shadows of Melchizedek all through the scripture. We're about to enter into a times of refreshing that a priesthood is going to come out of that's going to minister life only and not death. Going to minister after the power and the source of the endless life. Going to care, not care what kind of denomination you are, where you come from or anything. They're just God waiting to happen. The best example I can give you is God spoke to me a few years ago and said you need to decide where you're going. And I said, okay, what's my choices? He said, you can continue to prophesy for me or you can prophesy as me. I said, I'll take the ass. Melchizedek moves as God in the earth. Now, we've got all kinds of ideas about who Melchizedek was. Uh, some people say he was Jesus. I'm fixing to get deep on you now. Is that all right? Some, he could preach that way. The words of no private interpretation. I'll never tell you I'm wrong. Everybody, I'm right and everybody else is wrong. We know he wasn't Jesus because Jesus had a genealogy. Melchizedek did not have a genealogy. The only other person in the scripture that does not have a genealogy is the first Adam. He was created, not born. Can I prophetically tell you that Melchizedek is you come back to your fullness, to your place in God, to have dominion like you were intended to have dominion. Can I tell you that? Melchizedek it, it is not a natural thing. It's a spiritual thing. It's a timeless thing. It's a... Uh, See, the, the Lord told me, you remember when God put Adam to sleep and took Eve out? There's no record of Adam ever being woke up. That's why we have eyes and see not, ears we hear not. That's why we don't. So the next thing on the agenda is for Adam to be woke up. The next thing on the agenda is not another revival. Those are always going to happen. The next thing is an awakening. And now listen, listen. Unless somebody moves the body, when Adam wakes up, he's going to be in the same place he went to sleep. And he went to sleep in the garden where there was overflow And plenty. And when he wakes up, 
he's going to be back in the garden, a realm of overflow and plenty. And it's not going to be how do you survive on thus and such. It's going to be what will you do with overflow. As we, as Adam wakes up in the realm of dominion, as you begin to wake up and take your place in the, in the realm that you were supposed to walk in from the beginning, whatever you call something is what it's going to become. God brought the animals to Adam to see what he would name them. So could I submit, this is just me suggesting, that you call what you have been through, not tribulation, but training. Could I submit you've not been tribulating, but you've been being purged. If you didn't have any fruit, I wouldn't be talking to you because I'm not talking to people that don't have fruit. But if you bore some kind of fruit in your life, some kind of fruit in your life. If you bore anything in your life, any anything in your life, then God says, when hard times come, if you're already bearing fruit, it ain't the devil, it's me. Could I submit to you that everything that you have been through, we'd like to think it was the devil, But everything that you have been through, I'm not talking about the world in general. I'm talking about those that love God. Those that love to move under the power and the anointing of God. Those those that are hungry for God. I'm I'm not talking to the general population. Could I submit to you that everything you have been through in your life has has been God shaving away what you won't need in your next day? Can I prophetically tell you that the thing, the purging you have been through is not to teach you how to do <clears throat> survive a month on $100. The purging you have been through was to teach you when all your bills are paid and you have a million dollars, what do you do then? We know what we're doing when we're sacrificing. We know what we're doing when we broke. But what you going to do when overflow is here, what will you do with it? Do you have a plan? Do you have a vision? Well, uh, 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 I I don't know. Uh, I don't know what I'll do. Then you need to get a plan. Because God will not put more on you then you can bear. If you can't bear a million dollars, he won't put it on you. He'll give it to me. Because I can bear it. I've been broke and I've been rich. And no matter how I try to look at it, broke wasn't no fun. I say I've been broke and I've been ugly and been poor. And as long as there's a God... And a plastic surgeon in Marietta, Georgia. (laughs) I will never be broke nor ugly again. (laughs) Somebody said, Dr. Connie, you're not going to have surgery. I'm going to nip, tuck, lick, patch, everything. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. By the time I get finished with myself, they want nothing on me be real but Jesus. Because money answers all things. Now I said all that to say this. What does Melchizedek do? Melchizedek is authorized to handle the tithe of Abraham and his seed. Now why did God have to bring a priest out of the New Testament to receive Abraham's tithe 
when there was about to be a priesthood with the Levites, as a matter of fact, it says the Levites was already in Abraham's loins. Because no, let me tell you what God did you ready for. No priesthood is authorized to handle the amount of wealth that comes from Abraham and his seed, except Mount Jesus. 